I like to sort of start with a simple example for this talk. So the idea is that you're going to build a bike flasher, OK? Just like one of those little things you put in your bike that flashes an LED. And, uh, and you're going to turn the product and get out there, and it's going to be great. You're going to kickstart it and make millions of dollars, whatever, right? And, uh, and you decide, OK, what, I, what, I'm gonna, what am I going to do for designing the circuit? Right? It just has to flash a light. I'm going to use a 555 timer. Everyone here who's in the electrical field will know what that is. In fact, I can probably show you this bill of materials. And any kind of electrical engineer who's been through sort of an undergraduate program, whatever it is, could put this together and make it work just seeing this bomb. And this is the bomb that is generated, in fact, by like a typical schematic capture tool. And so the number one mistake that a lot of people do is they say, well, this is a bomb, and I'm going to hand it off to the factory. I'm going to have them go ahead and build this. And it'll be great. It's going to work great. The problem is, is this bomb has not nearly enough information inside of it for a factory to do what it wants to do. So for example, like size. There's nothing on the bomb that says anything about the size of a resistor, right? It tells you about the value of the resistor. So if you, look, if you look at the original bill of materials, we have like a 100 ohm resistor and a 20K resistor and whatnot. You know, what's the size of it? Resistors come in all shapes and sizes. They're big, they're small, they're surface mount. They have different tolerances and so forth. They have different um, levels of, of thermal precision sensitivity. So uh, like one product I had worked with uh, had a really precise servo driver in it, and it got really warm. And there's a thermal gradient across the board, and they didn't specify the drift of the resistor over temperature. And they found a, like, sort of a systematic effect offset in, all of the, in, all, in, the, in the final product. And it's because they just specified the, the resistance and the, and the percentage tolerance, but not the parts per million drift per C. And so those sorts of things, if you leave them out, can go ahead and cause an underlying problem in the product in the field at the end of the day. Uh, another thing is that you know, capacitors are not all created equal. I'm actually kind of like a capacitor connoisseur. I love capacitors. I, I sit there, and I read about them, and I study their dielectrics and all these, all these sorts of things. And they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And what makes them really beautiful and interesting is none of them are perfect. Right? Everyone is a special snowflake. So there's, uh, you know, there's electrolytic capacitors, tantalum capacitors, there's um, you know, ceramic capacitors, all these different types of things. Uh, if you go ahead and specify a capacitor, say, I want a 10 microfarad capacitor. right? Man manufacturer will go ahead and reach in a bid and pull something up. It's probably going to be the cheapest, jankiest capacitor ever. It'll leak. It will have bad tolerance. It'll have bad temperature characteristics. But it'll be really, really cheap. That's typically what you're going to, going to get. But it's really important to specify the dielectric type and know what those dielectrics do. So for example, I know that uh, some companies have a policy of not putting tantalum capacitors in their products. And the reason is that tantalum capacitors have a tendency to catch fire. Uh, when you go ahead, and if they don't have a sufficient, uh, what's called a, a ripple current rating, uh, if, the, if there's a bunch of current that goes in, they go out in a bright puff of white smoke. Um, and this typically happens when you put a tantalum capacitor, for example, on the input of, your, of, your, of the power supply. So people say, I'm going to put this big capacitor on the input, I'm going to like, pass FCC and all the noise emissions, all sorts of stuff. And then what happens when you plug it into the power supply? A huge rush of current goes right into the product, and it goes right in the capacitor. So the, the peak current's really high. And what will happen is, when you're in prototyping, you won't see this, because you plug your thing in and out maybe 100, 200 times during the prototyping phase. But maybe in 1 in 10,000 iterations, that capacitor will blow up. And guess what? Once you're shipping it, you're going to get people saying, there's smoke and fire coming out of my product. This is not making me happy. I want a full refund and blah, blah, blah. So some, some companies just simply say, we don't use tantalum capacitors because that dielectric is, is too risky to use for them. Um, I'm a personal fan of ceramic capacitors. I really like them. I use them as much as I can in all my stuff. And Wikipedia recently got a really good page on ceramic capacitors. When I was like doing a little more background research for this, I actually spent like an hour or two reading the upgraded page for it. And they, have, they actually have now the tables of the, the, the dielectric constant meanings um, in there. So if you get a capacitor that says like X5R, Y5U, Z5, whatever it is, um, those numbers say, for example, what the temperature, low end, the high end, and the tolerance band is, right? So if you got like a Z5V capacitor, right, it can work from 10 degrees C to 85 degrees C, and it has a tolerance range of uh, plus 22 to minus 82 percent for capacitance. In other words, there's a hundred percent range in the capacitance that it can operate on over the entire range, right? So if you think you're using a 10 microfarad capacitor, it may actually be like two microfarads in your rated application if you're not paying attention to these codes. 
So a lot of times when people are first engineering, like they go into a lab, they pick out some capacitors, they put it in, they prototype the circuit, it all works great. Um, and then they go to manufacturing and they wonder why it's not working. It's because the lab will stock really good capacitors. They can afford them. They're like 50 cents a piece and you're prototyping your circuit, they looks good. You go to China, you want to go manufacture, the capacitors are really cheap. All of a sudden, you're like 80% out of spec on your capacitance and your product is not working. So you really need to pay attention to your capacitors as you spec them out. X-3.3 slash no PV, right? And if you're going to go ahead and specify a bomb, say, to another engineer to build your circuit, you would say, give me an LM3670MF 3.3, because the thing that matters to you is the part and the voltage, right? You go and hand this off to the manufacturer, you don't have the X and the slash no PB, what happens? It turns out it's perfectly orderable without those two parts. But what happens is that if you drop the no PB extension, you get parts with lead in it. Okay, and you're wondering, like, why am I getting such a good discount on these parts? It's because they have lead and they can't sell to anyone else. And you're the guy who didn't put slash no PB at the end of your parts because you didn't know that that was actually an orderable suffix and you actually told the factory to get parts that you can no longer sell in Europe or California. Right? Or, for example, the X tells you the number of parts in the reel. So if I want to get uh, like 500 parts in the reel or 3,000 parts in the reel, I forget which way it goes, but that suffix will tell you which one you're going to get. So you say, I'm going to do initial prototype run of uh, 1,000 units, right? Wonderful. You, you, you drop the X and you get a reel of 3,000 because that's what you told the manufacturer to get. You run 1,000 units. How many are left over? 2,000. You got 2,000 left over. Who's paying for it? You are. Right? So at the end of the day, you had this quotation, it looked really good, the run's going along fabulously, the parts come out, and then you get this invoice at the end of the day with like, for the excess. And it's like half the product's cost. You're like, what the heck, I don't have the cash to pay for this, I didn't ask for this. And they say, no, actually you did. Your bomb said for me to buy a reel of 3,000 parts. They followed your bomb to the letter, right? They assume maybe you want to use the parts in the future run, or maybe you're going to resell them, or maybe you're going to like, you know, have some other clever idea on what to do with those parts. They're just following orders. They give you the per unit price, and the excess is your problem because you, you went ahead and told them to order that. So when you go to a data sheet, there's always a part that says ordering information. And when I was like in college, I always ignored it because I was like, ah, whatever, I want to see like the specs and the parameters, and I want to see these sorts of things. And now that's like the first place I go. It's like, okay, what are the variations? Are they halogen free? Are they green? How many per things? Like how many, what's a finish? All these sorts of stuff. And then when I put it in the very first time into my database, I make sure that every character is correct because I've been, I've been burned by exact this, exactly this problem in the past. So at the end of the day, Documentation is very important, and so we go from you know, this sort of bill of materials at the bottom, which is what came out of like a design tool automatically in day one, to something that looks a bit more like this. Right? This is something that you might be able to hand off to a factory, and maybe they'll get it right at the end of the day. It has you know, not a 0.1 microfarad capacitor with designated C1. It's a 0.1 microfarad ceramic 25 volt 10% X5R capacitor. Right? So we know it's a ceramic. We have like, the right tolerance codes. The package type is an 0402, uh, and we say we want to buy it from Tayo Yudin, which is a, a ceramic capacitor manufacturer, and here's the, uh, the AVL, which is the authorized vendor list for it. And by the way, we also know the minimum order quantities. 10,000 is the minimum order quantity from Tayo Yudin, and the next one is 2,000, and so on and so forth. So once you get this sort of whole bill of tiers together, you're starting to get more visibility as to exactly what you're going to be buying at the end of the day, how your product's going to look. Uh, in some cases, you don't need to be so over-specified. For example, resistors that are truly jelly bean, I'll just say any slash open and let the manufacturer recommend to me what resistors they use. Because sometimes there is a, a benefit in having these guys tell you uh, what they buy the most of, right? If this guy has a really good relationship with Murata and not TDK or whatever it is, then they're going to go ahead and say, well, if you bought from Murata, we'll get like a 20% discount. So go ahead and use our parts. And you say, okay, that's fine. That's great. Um, and then also, in addition to what is on the top here, see we end at the 555 timer. If you go below it, you see we also have, for example, the PCB in the bomb, right? We have the case in the bomb. We have uh, the little polyethylene bag that it goes in, the screws, right? The master carton that it goes in so you can put it into a container to ship to China. Each one of these things I have at least once forgotten at one point in time in my bomb and something has gone wrong. So like, th like when you develop uh, your design in, it, in like Altium or something, it doesn't put the PCB in the bomb because duh, you're designing a PCB. You hand this off to a manufacturer, the manufacturer says maybe you're going to consign the PCB, right? So they give you the quotation back and you're looking at 
three different competitive quotes and one manufacturer is substantially cheaper than the other, like, oh, this one looks great. Except until you look at it, you're like, I forgot to put the PCB on the bomb to tell them that I'm actually going to buy the PCB. I was working with another project which almost looks like it might be torpedoed because they have a little micro SD card that they put in there to like hold the firmware. So they quote out the whole cost project, they raised money, got the whole thing covered. But the micro SD thing was a four gig card, wasn't in the bomb because it was a little thing that's loose off to the side, wherever it was. And the price of that is equal to the price of the rest of the circuitry, right? And so now they're all of a sudden like, shoot, we have to like, you know, get twice as much money. We're 2x off in terms of our cost because we forgot to put our micro SD card in the bomb. It's really easy to forget because this is a little thing. You always just think about it. You just grab it on the desk, engineer, throw it in, you're done, right? Who cares? It's really important to, forget th to remember this. Like, I've had a little nut that I forgot once to put on the bomb of Wi-Fi card to hold it in place. So I got samples of the product. Everything looks great testing it. I shake it, it rattles. I'm like, why is this thing rattling? I open it up and I'm like, the Wi-Fi card's loose. Like, what's going on? And they're like, well, you told us to put the screw in, but there's no nut on the bottom. So we just built it just like that because that's what your bomb said, right? This is, it, was, it was completely my fault. I whiffed, right? But we had to go back. Fortunately, nuts are easy to get. Those weren't too much of a problem, but I've also forgot, forgotten like the master carton. So you go to the factory, they're running all the product, they're in little you know, retail packs, wherever it is. They say, great, let's go ahead and ship these out to the retailers. And they say, what box are you going to use? I'm like, what do you mean what box am I going to use? You know, a box, get any box. They're like, oh, we have to custom make those boxes for your product. It's going to take two weeks. Two weeks, are you kidding me? I have to get these things to the shelf with the guys like, now we're going to air freight these things. They're like, well, you didn't tell us that you need these, you know? And so you need to remember like everything on your bomb, down to the last label, down to the last UPC code, all these sorts of stuff has to be on there. Otherwise, you will just get bit at the very last minute and you won't be able to ship your product on time. So that's documentation going forward. There's documentation going back where change happens, right? You know, there is sort of like the design process right, which is fun and it's a little more fluid and whatnot. And then there's a point at which you sort of hand it off to manufacturing. And the kind of the, the point at which I say you're really starting to put like a change process is once you have your quotation for the manufacturer. You've, you've shook in hand and he says, okay, it's going to cost us $5 to do this in quantity 1,000 based on this bill of materials. After that point, if you want to make a change, you need to get really serious about documenting your change. And so typically, like for example, this is a, a format of a change order that I would use with the factories I work with. Like, a little bit of background, like how did this change come about? Because I forget, I'll be like, why did I do this change? Like, oh, okay, that's why. Okay, we had, to, we had an engineer who wanted to modify this. And the, and the change order details gives you like the original component value, what it changes to, you know, and some comments. And then also very importantly, like the material disposition. What happens to all that excess material at the end of the day? So if you want to change one component out, and you throw it away, or you want to sell it, you want to keep it, you want to repurpose it, purpose it, you kind of have to tell them what to do with that material. And I also like to reference a purchase order as well inside the change order, so I know which purchase orders this change applies to, because if you're doing lots of products, right, like not lo like lots of volume, but actually, you know, units of products, right, you, you do your first lot, and then you do your second lot, maybe you want to make a change, right, and so you only want the change to be applied from the second lot outward, so having a reference to a PO really helps in terms of tracking that. Otherwise, sometimes they'll go back and rework all of your existing material and hold, hold material going to customers. And so uh, having really good docs like this can save your butt. Uh, so for example, if you look on the date on this one, the date on this change order is 27th of February 2014, right before Chinese New Year, okay? And so I issued this ECO sort of being like, this is probably a bad idea to issue right before Chinese New Year, but uh, we, gotta, we gotta get it done, right? Come around March, and they start up the factory and stuff. They go and run the material. I'm, I'm feeling really uneasy about this. Ask the engineer, like, have you, have you gone ahead and implemented the change? Said, oh, yeah, sure, sure, we did it. I said, can you send me a photo of the circuit board? They sent me a photo, and they didn't do the change, right? And so then I, I go back, and I say, like, look, I have this documentation. We talked about this. You acknowledge the email. The factory says, oh, you're right. We'll rework all the material at our cost because you had this documentation which showed us that, in fact, you had requested this. We had approved it and so on and so forth. So this is, this is why this sort of stuff can be really important, operationally speaking, for getting your product out on time.